Uh, good evening. Welcome at the Norton uh, Museum of Art. It's such a pleasure to have you uh, tonight for a very special event. Um, thank you for being also understanding of all of the uh, COVID policy. Um, we have now, as you could realize, moving every of our programs uh, outdoor here for cocktail and so on. Um, and we most probably going to continue that during the whole season, uh, making sure that your um, uh, safety is assured and also for the protection of our own staff. So thank you for your understanding, but it's important. Um, I'm going now to have to put my glasses on, which uh, unfortunately is necessary. Here we are. Um, so I want to thank uh, all of you to be here. I want to acknowledge uh, all of our trustees. Many of them are here. I'm not going to ask you to stand up, uh, but the chair of the board is here and many of the trustees. So thank you for specifically to all of you for your support to the museum continually to make possible for the Norton to do all of these amazing programs. So for the trustees, thank you. Um, I want to also thank my staff, because without the staff, nothing will be able to happen, especially in this time of uh, logistic and changes and last minute changes. Abby, on behalf of you and all of your team, thank you for everything you have been doing. Um, and just before we going into the, the, the program, I just want to remind you that uh, next week, January 20, we have the second Ed Levitch uh, lecture. Thank you, Jeannie, I know you're around. And that will be Emmanuel Ducamp coming to talk about the Morosov collection, which is that amazing collection of uh, French art in a Russian uh, Moscovite uh, collection. And that's right now at the uh, Vuitton uh, Foundation in Paris. If some of you have seen it, and if you go to Paris for whatever reason, please go to see that. It's amazing. And then January 27, we're back here, um, thanks to uh, Mark Lincher, of course, and Pace. And we're having Alexandra Rover, who is the grandson of uh, Calder, uh, coming to talk about that beautiful car you may have seen in the lobby over there. So that will be uh, January 27. But let's focus on tonight. And first, again, I want to uh, thank Space Gallery and Jeff Kuhn Studio uh, for making uh, this uh, talk tonight possible. Thank you, Alison, for making also that possible. I really appreciate. And uh, we have a treat tonight. Uh, my challenge is to introduce the two speakers. So I'm going to start with Massimiliano, who I had the privilege to know uh, before. When I was in Kentucky, he was uh, courageous enough to come to give us a lecture over there. And believe me, it was a hoot. Uh, and Massimiliano uh, Gianni is the artistic director of the new museum in New York. And we have the director, Lisa, over there. Philip, thank you, Lisa, for being here. So a lot of people from New York. Uh, Massimiliano is in charge uh, of uh, the institution program uh, and has done absolutely so many surveys of many uh, um, famous artists, which I will have to skip the list because it's too long. Um, Mila, um, before that, of course, uh, he was running the Nicola Trussardi Foundation in Milan, which is really an exciting uh, place of creativity and, and, and contemporary art. And he has created major exhibitions, collaborating with museums and foundations in China, in Greece, in Italy, in Lebanon, in the United uh, Kingdom, Switzerland, and Qatar. Um, specifically with Jeff Koons, he has created two major surveys, uh, the exhibition called Appearance Stripped Bear, Desired and the object in the work of Marcel Duchamp and Jeff Koons even. And that was at the Museo uh, Rumex in Mexico City in 2019. And the second one was very more recent. The second one is Jeff Koons' Lost in America, which is the first and the largest survey of Koons' work in the Middle East and Asia, uh, which opened in November 2021 in Doha. Um, at the Hal Rihat uh, Museum. So, fantastic career, and Massimiliano is uh, always um, on the cutting edge, knowing what's going on, and is a fabulous speaker. So, now the challenge is to introduce you, Mr. Kunz, or Jeff, or Jeff Kunz. Um, passionate, as you know, um, uh, for the art at a very early age, um, through, in fact, uh, his father was an interior designer and an exposure to art. Um, he went to the Maryland Institute College in Art uh, in Baltimore to get his BFA. And then he moved to New York in 1977, where his first job was at the Museum of Modern Art. And I just heard a rumor from one of our donors here who knew that, apparently you were the best-selling person for membership at MoMA during that period. 
So if you want a job here, let me know. Because <laughs> <laughs> but I heard you were an amazing, amazing seller of memberships, which we love, by the way. So what I didn't know is after that, you left and you went to Wall Street Commodity Broker to support your studio and your artistic uh, uh, career. And that's really uh, impressive. But thank God you didn't stay too long in the stock market. And he went then on uh, creating his first um, uh, uh, works and series exhibit the first time at the New Museum in New York in 1980. Again, the New Museum is always cutting edge and avant-garde of everything. So we're all looking at what they're doing and then we do it after, but it's okay, we, we love that. Um, 1983, uh, uh, Jeff Koons began the Equilibrium series, uh, suspending you know, basketball in aquarium tank filled with water, uh, working, which I didn't know neither, with the Nobel Prize uh, winning physicist Richard Feynman, and you kind of uh, decided or created that precise mixture of water and salt to make things floating in the middle of the tank, which we were all wondering how magical it could be and how you managed to do that. Um, and that interest in buoyancy, which is, you know, the, the art of floating, if I want to say, really got um, a great influence on your on your whole career with the inflatable, which is really one of the most famous part of, uh, of your career for then career, because not finished, you're going to have so many other things you're going to create for, for us and for the world. The very famous one you remember in 2007 was the rabbit floating uh, 50 feet over the Fifth Avenue in New York for the Macy Thanksgiving Parade. I don't know if you remember that, but that was also really cool. I could go on and on, but um, also uh, Jeff Koons combined Rococo fantasy and pop kitsch um, when he did that uh, series called Made in Heaven. Um, then there were, of course, the Celebration series in 1994, the Popeye story in 2002, the Hulk Elvis 2004, the Antiquity series, which as a decorative art person, I'm always responding very much, starting in 2008, uh, inspired from Antiquity, of course, and the Goddess of Love and Beauty, and the Gazing Ball series. Anyway, so... Um, I wanted to really uh, thank both of you to be here, and I wanted to acknowledge also our dear supporter Tony and Martin Sofnov, uh, because you may have seen in the gallery of the Museum of the Permanent Collection, we have a great work of art from you, sir, uh, which was a gift from Martin and Tony uh, through the 21st Century uh, Society gift, which is now called the Visionary Fund. Anyway, thank you so much again, and please enjoy this fantastic uh, conversation tonight. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I realize it's more accents coming up, but... Uh, <laughs> excuses. Um, thank you for being here tonight. I th we have a really, we are in for a treat. Uh, being in conversation with Jeff is always very exciting, very special. Um, we decided to focus this conversation tonight uh, on um, his work around Venuses, and uh, uh, starting from the piece that is premiering at Pace Gallery um, as, um, as of last night, which is uh, the most recent in, in a series of Venus sculptures that Jeff uh, completed in the last um, 10 years or so, if I remember correctly. So I'll show you some photographs of the work, which you can also see, of course, in, in person. And, um, it's a work inspired by actually the most recent Paleolithic Venus sculpture discovered in 2008, which is called the Ole Fels uh, Venus, uh, which was discovered in 2008. And uh, apparently it's the um, oldest uh, figurative representation of a human in the history of humanity. You see it here. It dates from sometime 35,000 and 40,000 years ago. It's sculpted in um, the tusk of a woolly mammoth, and uh, it was found in Germany. Um, interesting enough, it was found 70 centimeters from also the oldest flute uh, that it was carved in the bone of a vulture. And so people believe that in the valley where it was found is where the first uh, uh, evidence of human culture and human, or better, human uh, art uh, is uh, to, to be found. So I want to ask you, first of all, Jeff, how did you have access to, to this incredible artifact, which uh, you see here being uh, uh, scanned, and, uh, and how this particular piece was born? Uh, I think this is on. Yeah. 
So uh, I remember seeing an image of the Hohenfelds in uh, a magazine, and I thought, uh, you know, it's uh, such a, a beautiful object. And I had already started uh, making uh, balloon Venuses. I made uh, a Venus of the Hohenfelds, and um, no, pardon me, the Venus of Willendorf. And that was the, uh, the first uh, balloon Venus that I uh, created, and I wanted to expand on that. And uh, so I created a total of four uh, different Venuses, the Hohenfelds uh, being uh, the last one that was able to uh, be realized uh, due to the time of production, and I worked with different technologies to create it. But um, I like to think of myself as kind of a philosophical artist, uh, I, an idea artist. I, I like to, uh, to f try to create things that have meaning, that can help us feel, that helps me feel connected to humankind in a more deeper way, that I can metaphysically feel like I can go back and uh, touch the, the meaning and the memory, a biological memory of what it means, the first kind of feelings of a sense of community and uh, a desire for an understanding of a vocabulary about inside, what takes place within ourselves and the exterior world, the outside. And I think the Venus of Hohenfeld's, the uh, balloon sculpture, uh, you know, touches on that. And it, it touches on it with a, a sense of its membrane uh, its membrane, uh, it's made out of stainless steel, the, uh, the final piece, but uh, you can look at it and think of, oh, it's kind of like a party balloon, but it's also very much like our interior membrane. It's, uh, it's like our, the, the umbilical cord. It's like going back into the womb. Maybe that's what it's created out of, uh, or aspects of uh, placenta or intestine. Uh, our interior being, the profoundness of that, and our relationship with uh, the exterior world, how we not only have a sense of self, but of community. And I, so I think uh, the Hohenfeld is trying to have this dialogue uh, about this internal, external uh, self and community. And did you actually have access to the sculptures and had it scanned, or how did you get the data for making the sculpture? What is the image we see here? Uh, Okay, so uh, this is uh, a CAT scanning machine uh, from, uh, and uh, this would be from uh, 3M in, uh, no, actually GE in uh, Hanover, Germany. And so I started working with them, and in uh, creating something like the Hohenfelds, I will design it, and it's a very complicated balloon to make. So I work with uh, a gentleman, Buster Balloon, and uh, Buster is a, a kind of a clown a balloonist, goes around, and, but really skilled at what you can do with uh, you know, a latex balloon. And so I'll design it, I'll let him know what I'm trying to create. He'll send a version to me and I'll look at it and I'll say, you know, that's great, but uh, you know, she needs legs. Or, you know, we have to, I want the back to be a little different. I'd like the back to actually be quite phallic. And so about a year and a half will go by in shaping and being able to realize the closest that, that I can get to uh, the Venus, what I'm, I'm looking for. So this back and forth uh, process. And then it gets scanned? Uh, then uh, we will go to, uh, to GE and we'll start making the balloons. And by this point, we already have it down. We, we know that it's gonna take so many minutes to make one, and we're gonna get the proportions we're looking for. And we'll blow up about 100 of them. And, uh, and then I will line them up, I'll choose which ones, and then we'll scan about seven that meet a certain kind of the best representation overall of what I'm looking for. Uh, then we can make that work from the inside out. And so uh, that's what this is really kind of showing. If I stand up and just come over here, you know, this is an X-ray. And so all that information from the knot and what takes place truly is there. It's objective. This is in subjective information and how all the chambers twist together. And uh, so that lets me uh, be able to work with uh, computer uh, rendering uh, technicians 
that I can realize this and reverse engineer it and that it doesn't become subjective and more about their interpretation of what that balloon really is like other than what you know, I want. I really want the viewer to look at it and feel the realism of the original memory. Do, this is a cheap psychoanalysis, but do you have a, a primal scene of a balloon in your life? No, I'm curious. I mean, no. you make so many balloons. Actually, it, it, because we're speaking also prehistoric times, uh, Jeff is capable of saying uh, really uh, uh, incredible things. And, and once in, in a conversation, he told me that to imagine how he must have been, you know, sitting around the fire, maybe 35, 40,000 years ago, and cooking your meat and seeing the intestine blow up or the bladder of the animal blow up. And uh, he was suggesting that that is maybe the first inflatable that humans have seen. And it's, um, it's you know, we are laughing, but it's also a very um, destabilizing image that, that, you know, that encounter with a sense of plenitude is also so um, close to, to a cycle of life, no? And, um, yeah, and that it's, uh, it comes from the, the internal part of that animal. If they are watching, looking at their kill, and seeing the gases start to form in the intestine and the stomach and, and start to think what they can do with it. But, it, you know, of course we realize that it's also representing our internal being. So if you would make something that would be out of the intestine or the, or the stomach, that it's also referencing from our internal being. You know, I'd like to think of its uh, memory of the womb or uh, just a, a breath or, you know, this, uh, the sense of uh, breathing, you know. And so the, is there a, a balloon at some party in your life that you remember particularly well? Uh, no, I, no, I think that it's the anthropomorphic part that, you know, you know, the, how what that oxygen does, how it just is kind of a symbol of, you know, we inflate and it gives us kind of life energy. It gives us the energy to go forward and then, you know, we exhale and that's kind of a symbol of death. And uh, so it just this, and this, uh, and being able to maintain that, uh, you know, you can't actually maintain that. And if I would work with, um, real balloons, you know, and uh, what we would have over here at the gallery would just be uh, made out of the latex. It wouldn't last. And so within a certain time period, eventually all the molecules would go through the membrane and it would become soft and lose its form. Uh, these pieces always have kind of that optimism, that kind of eternal optimism of it taking a deep breath. Speaking of optimism, um, this is, again, information I gather in, in many trips and adventures with Jeff. Uh, once we went to Mexico together, and as anybody would do, you know, Jeff is on the plane and he's reading Bataille, The Cradle of Humanity, which is the anthology of George Bataille's writing, the, the French philosopher, uh, his anthology of writings about prehistoric art. And uh, um, in that book, the, the, the original essay that Bataille wrote was about the... Um, the, the caves paintings in Lascaux, he attributes the beginning of art and the, the moment in which um, humans enter into the world of the Homo sapiens and into the world of culture, live in the world of nature, as the moment in which they make the experience of, uh, he says, festive exuberance. Now, the idea that we enter into human culture the moment in which we make the experience of play you know, and we get out of the world of work. And, uh, um, and so, you know, there is so much celebration in your work, so much play in your work, and so I'm curious how you see that in uh, relation to your own work and even there, say, in relation to the history of art or the history of humanity. Um, Big questions for a Saturday night in Palm Beach. <laughs> yeah, <but>. absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. You know, uh, for myself, I think that you know, of course, to be able to have the ability to reflect on something and to contemplate uh, and, and to have reflection on the circumstances that we find ourselves in and, you know, uh, how we can embedder our situation, how we can have more pleasure uh, from life experience, uh, what we can make of life experience. But for myself, if I think about uh, finding meaning, I think uh, one is when you learn 
in a way to take care of yourself, and then the desire to uh, take on a responsibility to try to take care of others. And we all find that in different ways. And I think that you know, within uh, prehistoric times, it's the same situation that where you're able to once kind of have a fantasy for your own needs, meet your own needs, but then uh, take it and where you want to help the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's really, I think, a transcending uh, uh, moment. You often speak about actually taking care of the viewer and, uh, and saying that you don't want to let the viewer down. What does it mean for you, etc.? Uh, well, to be able to have trust. I work with uh, a craft and different uh, ways of manipulating material so that I can try to, and through a visual uh, manner and through the I guess the content that I'm showing, to try to communicate to the viewer that the attention to detail is really to pay attention to them. That what I really care about is, is you, the viewer, and it's not this object. This object, it's, uh, uh, it's just a metaphor for, for you and for communication. And that what's really important is uh, uh, the dialogue about how we can experience transcendence and how we can uh, uh, enjoy trying to become really the, the best individuals that we can be. Uh, you know, that's basically the dialogue. I like to think of Walter Isaacson's uh, uh, book on uh, Leonardo, and, uh, or not actually uh, on Leonardo, but uh, Steve Jobs. And, uh, in, <laughs> One or the but, other. <laughs> because he did, both, uh, he did both biographies, right? And, and both are fantastic, and I've... Uh, uh, enjoyed uh, speaking with Walter about both, but in the Steve Jobs book, he tells a story about Steve uh, learning from his father. They're in the backyard and they're painting a fence that separates their neighbor's uh, yard. And Steve couldn't understand why his father thought it was so important to paint both sides of the fence. And his father's telling him that, you know, that uh, it may not affect us, but, you know, the neighbor's going to see that other side. And it had a really big impact on Steve because, you know, that's why when you would look at how the computers are designed or the iPhone, all this type of attention being given to these products, uh, the Walkman or whatever, that, uh, that it was really for, you know, the technician, anybody coming into contact with these objects, that you could show them that you care about them. And so I've always felt a connection to this type of philosophy. Now we're looking at a picture of another piece from antiquity and, and from the Venus works, which is the, uh, in this particular case, it's uh, loosely inspired by the Venus of Willendorf, uh, which we see here in a photograph. So this is um, a few thousand years uh, later. Um, the piece is famously now preserved in, in the uh, Natural History Museum, in the Kunsthistorische Museum in, uh, in Vienna. Um, and uh, I want to ask you, you, you have often spoken about the ritual in relation to these objects and in relation to, to your work, no? Um, and for many of you, if you visited an exhibition by Jeff Koons, you know that now people also flock to his shows to, to take selfies, to, to really participate with these objects. And it is a strange ritual of narcissism and, and visibility that your work participates in. I, is that something you anticipate in your work? Is that something that you think it's part of your work? Or when you talk about the kind of ritualistic power of the original objects, what, what is it that you are referring to? Uh, meaning. You know, uh, uh, finding uh, meaning. So I, I enjoy the, the contemplation of meaning and looking at something like that. I mean, you can imagine how it, it feels in your hand or just uh, the, the possible ritualistic uh, aspects of a piece like that. Uh, the narcissistic part of a reflection, I've never really have understood that. And, uh, you know, I know, of course, the, the myth of narcissists and all this, but, you know, the other uh, senses, like uh, people enjoying hearing and, uh, you know, sounds, uh, it's never looked at in, in a negative uh, in a negative uh, kind of way, but within a vision, if there's a reflection in, uh, uh, of, of oneself in vision, it's kind of looked at as a, a negative. 
And I, I don't really understand that. That's an interesting question, also in relation to the Venuses, mm -hmm. um, and now not to be a, a second-rate feminist historian, mm -hmm. but you know there is a whole uh, um, a, a wealth of literature around whether or not these objects were made by women. No, mm -hmm. we we know actually the first um, representation of humans are of women, both the Ole Fels uh, sculpture and the, the paintings in the Chevette. Um, caves, but we don't know who made them. And, and also, I mean, we get a sense that women were um, worshipped in some form, uh, but we don't know if the real creature in, in that moment in time were treated with respect or not. We unfortunately have plenty of evidence today that we can worship women and at the same time uh, in pictures and at the same time not necessarily in, in everyday life. So, um, and, and the whole question of who has right to represent a woman body is nowadays more relevant than, other, than ever. So first of all, I want to ask you if you have a sense, even just as a personal feeling, uh, about who you think was making these sculptures and who were using them. You know, there are, there are also hypotheses around the fact that this sculpture is faceless because uh, the woman who made it couldn't see her face. She could only see her body. Um, some anthropologists actually <laughs> claimed that she might have seen her face in a pond or, or elsewhere. So first of all, just out of curiosity, if you have any opinion about who made these objects. And second also, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, if you as a male artist also have to ask yourself mm -hmm. questions about you know, the right to represent women body and what does it mean today? Yeah. Uh, there are many, you know, questions about a, a piece like uh, Venus of Willendorf, whether it's knitting that's on her, her head, whether it's a type of woven uh, like a wool, and the same with part of the garments. I always would think of the hands coming over the breast. Some people will say that that is actually like part of a garment that's uh, uh, coming over uh, the breast. Uh, what I enjoy about it is the, uh, the celebration of uh, fertility and, and uh, of, of life and the acceptance of life. In many ways, people try to avoid nature and they have a hard time of coming into uh, a relationship with nature and acceptance with nature and uh, of just embracing uh, you know, how we come into the world. Uh, to me, uh, somebody like uh, Giatta, uh, this idea of a, a feminine uh, a goddess, uh, you know, I, I embrace the, uh, uh, very much, but as far as made by masculine or, or, or feminine, uh, you know, I don't know, but the, um, the embrace of, uh, of fertility and just of nature, mm -hmm. yeah. I'll just show again the Balloon Venus to and then we go on to, so this is um, the Dolby Vestolich Venus, yes. correct? Yeah. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about this piece? And uh, have you, uh, this is a very specific question, have you had a chance to actually observe any of the Paleolithic objects up close to okay. hold any of them? Uh, or? Well, I haven't been able to hold any of them, but I've uh, viewed them. Yeah. I've seen them in different uh, collections. Uh, uh, in uh, Europe, and I've acquired a lot of little replicas of them. So at my studio, I have like a small little Dolny. But I enjoy uh, this uh, kind of Venus uh, uh, figure because uh, there's also a sculpture in the uh, Kunsthistorik Museum that is uh, representing different phases of life. And I actually, when I saw the sculpture, thought that it represented uh, a young woman, a middle-aged woman, and an older uh, uh, a woman. But it actually represents a young woman, uh, a middle-aged man, and then an older uh, uh, a woman. And uh, I thought that that was very interesting. So I saw this sculpture as also having the possibilities of representing kind of the three different ages, uh, youth, middle age, and of, uh, of older age. So the breasts on the Dolny are, uh, one is slightly younger, on the one side, then in the, the center, kind of like this phallus part, is more of a representing middle age to me. And then on the end, the one is kind of like an older breast. Um, I also think of them, it's interesting, there is a painting by Diego Rivera with a cactus in, in the show that is quite similar. And um, 
I couldn't help also think about Brancusi in relation to these works, you know, and, and that's another very interesting mythology around maternity that emerges at the beginning of the 20th century in the work of the Dadaist, in the work of the Surrealists. The, the idea of a kind of automatic woman, which I think, you know, a piece like your balloon Venus also seems to allude to. Now, this idea of a, a woman that is almost, uh, um, you know, as the futurists would have it, as beautiful as a car, uh, with all the problems associated with it, or, um, you know, Breton speaking of Frida Kahlo would say that she was a bomb with a ribbon. Not this, uh, this idea of woman as a mechanical force that is almost alien from, uh, from the human, and, um, and of which many sculptures by Brancusi are clearly a, um, an image. So I, I'm curious if that's a sort of imagery that, that is relevant to you, that you think plays in your thinking. You're looking to me like I'm a crazy <laughs> no, no, person, no, no, but no, no. I'm trying to entertain. Yes, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Now, I, I was thinking that uh, in Vienna, I had the opportunity in the uh, Natural History uh, uh, Museum to have the Venus of Willendorf in the center of the rotunda. And it was really spectacular, because if you've been, of course, in the museum, it's a uh, beautiful uh, rotunda, very, very large, and then right upstairs, uh, they have the, uh, the Venus of... Uh, uh, Willendorf there. Um, for me, I wasn't thinking of anything uh, kind of mechanical. I enjoy uh, the reflection because I enjoy the involvement of when you move around, it is affirming you. So it's always telling you that this experience, it's your own personal experience and what's important is what you're experiencing. That it's all about you. And uh, the only thing you ever have to bring to uh, a work of art is yourself, because it's all about what you experience from this interaction. And uh, th that's why that reflective surface is there. It's an exciting uh, surface, it's stimulating, and it helps to bring the attention that, uh, to yourself that uh, what's relevant here is uh, your perception of the world, your perception of your possibilities. Uh, the essence of your potential. Let's see, probably the last in this series, which is the, the Venus Les Push, which um, is uh, another Paleolithic um, sculpture. And uh, I don't know if you want to add anything about this particular work in your series. And actually, when did you... Uh, these works are all part of the antiquity uh, series. And, and when did you start this series and how, if you want to yeah. discuss that? You know, I, I believe the dates are probably around 2008, I believe. And they uh, go on, I believe that uh, uh, most of them were probably finished by around 16. Some of them were, uh, took more time to be able to make them. And when I say finished by the first one, that we were able to complete the, the first one, the image that you were showing of Les Buc, it was also uh, comes from an ivory uh, uh, bone, and the, the blackened part would be the original, and then the other parts are kind of busted out. They're kind of shattered out of the, uh, the original. But when you would fill and be able to repair the sculpture, this is what the shape would be. And, and so she has also sculpture. a decorated back, no? I think th th she has this, um, uh, these lines, these lines yeah, which right. people wonder if they are yeah. representation of the clothes or, uh, or that's, other. That's correct. Yeah. And um, I actually want to ask you about museums because we are in a museum and because the Antiquity series is very much about art history. Uh, you spoke about the, the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, which you have said it's probably your favorite museum in... Um, I, I want to ask you as an artist if you have some kind of ideal museum in mind, or what would a Jeff Koons museum look like? <laughs> uh, encyclopedic. Yeah. Uh, With great membership, by yeah. the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, uh, what, what, what took place at uh, MoMA, uh, I was always a preparator. And when I, I went to school also in Chicago, and I was a preparator in the Museum of Contemporary Art, and I wanted to be a preparator. A preparator hangs works within a museum. And uh, there were no positions available, but I kept calling every day, and they just said, finally, no, wait, we can put you in the ticket booth when people enter the museum. 
And I said, I'll take it. And uh, that was part of their membership department. And uh, when they had let me out of the ticket booth for a little bit of a break, I'd go to the membership desk. And I realized nobody was trying to, nobody had any interest in trying to inform people that if you upgraded your membership, you get a lot of different books and all these facilities. So I started to tell people, and I did double membership, and, uh, <laughs> which was really great. And uh, no, but uh, uh, Mrs. Rockefeller Blanchett, and uh, uh, she uh, thanked me, and I was, you know, I was really honored by that. But it was always just a way to, you know, uh, to stay engaged. And in the, you know, uh, during other parts of the day, I'd be able to go through all the different parts of the collection at MoMA and uh, to study, You'd see uh, the Duchamp's work, and go to the film library, uh, look at Man Ray's work, so it was great. And so do, do, you, do you have a vision for a museum for you? Would it be a, it, it would a, be a in, combination of contemporary and historic? You know, I think it would be encyclopedic. It would involve a lot of the uh, humanities. It would involve uh, the sciences, uh, uh, biology, neuroscience. Uh, it would be engaging, really, just about uh, human experience. It wouldn't be just defined where uh, museums dealing more with the visual arts or uh, different parts of our humanities. You, you have often credited, actually, John Dewey's uh, artist experience as a inspiring book for you, and uh, um, and I would imagine also the Barnes Foundation as a yeah. as a museum that is dear to you. I, can you say something about it? And well, I like the Barnes uh, collection, and I like John Dewey. You know, originally I would say when I started to become involved in, you know reading philosophy and uh, looking at philosophers, uh, philosophers. I always enjoyed like Kierkegaard and Sartre and uh, Nietzsche and uh, Plato. And, uh, but John Dewey, uh, the way of being able to present the information in such a simple way that uh, he'll define life experience as a, you know, one kind of cell organism interacting with its environment and the effect that it has on the environment and vice versa, the effect that the environment has on that organism, and that that's true communication. And, uh, you know, I think that's so uh, simple and uh, so correct. Let's see other images. Well, this is the metallic Venus. This maybe brings us back to, to the question I was asking you about the, the, uh, the kind of um, imagination of woman as a, as a machine, but I think you, you addressed it already. And with these works also, we enter into the realm of the digital, no? More so than, uh, even more so than the balloon dog, or, uh, you know, there is a, a kind of liquid quality in these works that, that is very digital and very contemporary. Um, is that a change also in, in the manufacturing of them? And uh, is that a change also about how you envision contemporary life, actually, Michel Kuo writing about these pieces says something quite amazing about how you go from envisioning the commodity as it used to be in the 19th and 20th century into the way in which the commodity looks today, in which you know, objects of desire and, and things we buy are immediately translated into data and into digital information. So is that a process that has fascinated you or it's more organic? Yeah. You know, I think uh, Massimiliano, you know, is, uh, saying desire, that my work has always been involved in desire. I like uh, to kind of get the, you know, the juices flowing, the different chemical reactions happening within our bodies and feeling mm -hmm. stimulated. And, uh, you know, when you have feelings, feelings become uh, ideas. And so to be able to get uh, different chemical reactions going, one of the things that... Uh, by the nature of what we're looking at uh, here this evening, uh, my work is really based in ready-mades. So this image that we're looking at comes from a ceramic piece that pre-exists in the world. Uh, most of my work, it's, uh, it comes from things that pre-exist. Now, when we looked at the Venuses, they're all you know hand-created by making these uh, balloon objects, but they're referencing things that uh, kind of pre-exist, and they're referencing cer certain materials or uh, like balloons, the membrane of a balloon, but there's always this connection to a ready-made. And uh, this is also 
this um, ceramic, what I liked about it, was also referencing Praxiteles' uh, work. And even though it's not the complete uh, shape of Praxiteles' uh, uh, work, and if I'm pronouncing it correctly, the uh, Kinos uh, uh, sculpture, one of the most uh, well-known sculptures ever created, the most uh, well-known of a, a female form, uh, it, it's referencing that. So this type of connectivity uh, through history. Uh, the arts give us that ability to make all these different uh, uh, connections. Let's see if we have, a, this is, it's called ballerina, this one, or? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. And, and so here also, the, the, what is the technique in, in this work and in the previous one? How are they made? Um, is it still polished stainless steel? Or? Yes. Uh, this is seated ballerina. And uh, I work with stainless steel quite often. I think every image we looked at so far this evening is uh, stainless steel. And I started working with it because I like the reflectivity of it and that it's really a proletarian material. And even though you can polish it up, it can be very abstract and uh, intoxicating uh, to look at through the reflection. But at the same time, its dialogue is that it's really a material that's quite strong and can be just melted down to make pots and pans and spoons and forks. You know, it, it's not just a luxurious uh, uh, material about luxury. But, uh, but it, it visually can be very uh, luxurious. But this comes from a small uh, ceramic piece, originally, I think, from a, a Hungary uh, a ceramic uh, um, uh, factory. And, but what's nice about these pieces is that I'm using the type of gradations that porcelain has used over the you know, past uh, centuries. And so it's not just monochrome color but you can have the, the flesh be a certain color pink and then have the knees gradated into different colors of, of pink. So the dress can go from one color blue to another. And there are different breakdowns and different edges of the breakdowns. And this, I think, is very kind of metaphysical because uh, when you deal with a gradation, I always loved as a kid looking at cereal boxes. And I think uh, it affected me in making this work, but. I would always love how you know the cereal box would have gradations on it. Maybe it'd start blue at the bottom and go to a light blue at the top, or you know uh, yellow and then come down to an orange. And it's used in in products because it's depicting time, and it's this uh, essence of time. And that's what's also embedded into these sculptures. This because uh, when we see a gradation, we think of a sunrise or a sunset, the passage of time. Let's see, I don't remember which images we have. Can I actually skip to, to the ceramics? Um, oh no, I don't have a picture of this ceramic series. Well, let's maybe talk about Pink Ballerina, um, which is a marble sculpture. Is that one solid marble or? Um, it's uh, one block. One of, block. Uh, a pink marble called Portugali. You know, you, you spoke about desire and getting the juices going, but right. when I think of this marble, uh, work, I, I think of a, um, an incredible essay by Mario Prats, the Italian art historian about Canova, which is titled The Erotic Frigidaire. No? And, and basically the text is about how Canova is incredibly erotic, but frozen to a point in which actually desire is completely suspended. And uh, um, which is quite similar actually to what you do in, um, in your work. To use another prosaic uh, description of what I'm trying to say. Once you told me that you asked, I don't know if it was Robert Plant or Jimmy Page, about their music, uh, about the Led Zeppelin, and they say sometimes you got to put a cold towel on it, which I don't exactly understand what it means. But this idea of a kind of protracted, frozen uh, desire. So um, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Uh, uh, that was Robert Plant. And I think Robert Plant was, because <laughs> we, we're speaking about feelings and of. Uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Page uh, told me one time that what Zeppelin was really trying to do was create gut-wrenching desire. And uh, I think they accomplished that. And Robert Plant, when I was speaking uh, one time to him, and I was talking to him about feelings and how I felt that I, I learned how to feel also through listening to their music, the power of their music. And, uh, and again, speaking about 
what uh, Page termed as gut-wrenching desire, he was speaking about sometimes you just have to put a cold towel on it. And uh, so I think- In full disclosure, I was offered for the first time a cold towel at the hotel today. And I thought of you, <laughs> and literally it was a very strange moment, but- <laughs> no, no, but I, as far as uh, Canova, I can see that in uh, Canova's work. Uh, this work is much closer uh, to uh, Bernini. And uh, I, I think that since uh, Bernini's work, uh, uh, Uccello's work, that there's uh, very few things have been made that uh, I think interact with the sense of, of movement and carving and the profoundness of, of stone uh, than this piece. I'm really pretty proud of this one. And this piece and, also originates from a small ceramic that? Uh, yes, only a, a four inch small a uh, little Dresden uh, ballerina. That you own or that has a family uh, well, history? Or uh, well, I mean, I own it. It yeah. doesn't come from my family. Sometimes I've worked with things that my grandparents have had. Uh, but it, when I realized that I was interested in this small little uh, ceramic, I started going online and getting different models of it so I would have the best uh, model uh, to work with. And now you started, unfortunately we don't have an image, or a, a series of porcelain sculpture, which are actually mm. made in marble, but painted in such a way they, they look like um, porcelain. I think this is also another quite interesting aspect in, in Jeff's work, you know, this idea of the replica. You know, as you say, the, the object is born as a ready-made and you remake it. Mm. And uh, sometimes the remake is a kind of act of perversion, such as yeah. you know, making a gigantic marble sculpture and then painting it so that it looks like uh, porcelain, and so he has also this very strange sense of scale and, mm -hmm. and physicality, um, and I don't know if that's something that you connect again to, yeah. to objects in your family yeah. history, or, um, yeah. or where does this idea of transforming the material come from? Um, I grew up in York, Pennsylvania, and uh, I grew up in a middle class family, and uh, I was curious about art. My father taught me aesthetics and my parents uh, let me know that I had some talent in drawing and I started taking art lessons on the weekends and I was always in art class all the time. And uh, I became prepared, I wanted to go to college but I didn't know what else to go to college for other than art. And I ended up in college and uh, when I went there, uh, the first day we went to the Baltimore Museum to see the Cone Sisters collection. And I realized I knew nothing about art. I mean, I had no idea about art history at all. I would have known Picasso, but I didn't know Brock. I didn't know Cezanne. I didn't know anybody. But I, I somehow was able to survive that moment. And right after coming back from the museum, I had my first art history lesson. Bo Davis was my teacher at Maryland Institute College of Art. And he brought up a Manet image and started talking about how different images within the uh, painting of Olympia, what these could be symbols of. And I, I started to realize how art so effortlessly connects you to all the human disciplines. And I think from that moment, I started to realize that, uh, that I wanted to be involved in art. It finally had a meaning for me. I had no idea what art could be. I realized that this can generate feelings and uh, that I can be connected in really a dialogue of what it means to be a person. But I also realized how art can destroy you it can disempower you. And I realized how it disempowered me, that I felt like I really should have known something about art and that to really be involved in it, I should know these different theories or I should know the history. And I, I realized you don't need any of that. You just really need yourself. And so I've always have tried to create an art to communicate to the viewer that whatever your history is, whatever, it's perfect. You can't have any other history than what you have. And everything's about this moment forward. It's about you. It's about your personal life. There's no place for judgment. So uh, I choose these images to be symbols 
that everything is perfect and it's about opening ourselves up to the world and to accept everything, to practice acceptance, because if we do, it's pure empowerment. Everything is a source for us. We can use, we can incorporate anything into our being, into our existence. And if we do the opposite, if we make judgment, if uh, I don't like that, and I don't know about that, and and we start alienating ourselves, we disempower ourselves, where we don't have everything at our service. I think Marcus Aurelius, in different ways, has said this uh, uh, very beautifully in the past, that really through acceptance that we empower our being. And that's why I work with the images that I do to try to communicate to each viewer that whatever your history is, whatever your experiences are, you're perfect. It's about this moment forward. I think that's a wonderful ending, Jeff. And maybe we take some questions from the audience. How, how do you choose your colors in all your images? You know, when you're, when you're choosing um, Venus, there's a lot of warm colors. When you're choosing a lot of... Uh, um, erotic things, it's a very kind of yellows and blues and, and brilliant. How do you decide what colors that you're implementing when you're using in your sculptures? Even this sculpture here, why not Carrera marble, beautiful Carrera marble, why rose marble? Uh, it's very intuitive. So, uh, you know, whatever just seems natural to me. Uh, I made this uh, pink ballerina the flowers that are placed in there. This work gets, it has, I guess, 29 different vases for live uh, flowers that are, are cut and that are uh, uh, placed there. But I also have made some stone sculptures, uh, a, a large black ballerina that's uh, much larger, but it's in a, a dark stone. I've made a large white uh, uh, ballerina out of a, a white marble. And you can put any color plant in a sculpture like this. There's, there's no correct plant, no correct color. Anything can be used. I work with ready-mades. Uh, you know, if I was creating this uh, glass right now, there's a lime in there, it would probably be green. But if I had a desire to make it a different color, to make it red for some reason, I am always free. You know, I'm not going to get tied up into some idea of ready-made that I can't do what I want to do. So I'm also free to uh, adapt that ready-made or to put any color there I wish. Yeah. But intuitive. <laughs> How many editions do you typically work with? Yeah. Uh, usually edition of three uh, plus an artist proof. And I started uh, working that way back in the mid 80s. And I thought at the time it was, it was kind of perfect where, because I, I wanted to make a body of work and then really reflect on new ideas. And then by the time that I could have another body of work, it would probably be about two years. And I, I, I didn't want to make too much work, so I thought that my ideas could be kind of politically distributed. If you had three, there would be enough of them that they could go in the world in different places that people would be able to interact with them. Uh, than if I just made one. And if I made one and somebody wasn't exhibiting it, or uh, it wouldn't be seen. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges in fabricating your works? And indeed, do you have ideas or designs that we don't have the technology to actually fabricate them yet? You know, it, it's interesting, but uh, a lot of times companies enjoy working with artists. and. Uh, and it's the reason that automatically you tend to take things to the edge. So uh, it's never my intention to try to uh, work in a certain area and then you know, keep asking more and more and more of that technology that we have to create a new technology or have it adapt in some way. But uh, automatically you, you try to get as much out of something. I mean, there are different projects that I've envisioned that I haven't been able to realize yet. Uh, one was permanent equilibrium. Uh, the equilibrium that I created in the tank is only temporary. Uh, but uh, then there are other very large flying 
type of uh, artworks that, uh, that I've designed that I haven't been able to realize, but they could be realized. Um, I just pulled up the image. Party head is a yeah. Yeah. 25 years to be uh, yeah, that's correct. And even though it looks very simple, because it's just a cone and then you have the brim, but to be able to get uh, sheet metal and have it polished on both sides and to be able to have it fold and meet perfectly the way it has to. And all of these uh, sculptures today, we take some of these reflective surfaces already for granted. But when I started making these, uh, uh, reflective surfaces, we had to create the machines to polish them because they didn't exist. We had to create these different ways of polishing these concaves and uh, these convex different shapes. Now when I say they didn't exist, I mean I'm sure in different uh, uh, areas of technology you could find people working on telescopes or doing different things, but we had to create these machines to do it within the art industry uh, or different normal fabrication industries, these machines didn't exist. Jeff, good to see you. Great, yeah. great talk. Thanks for being here. Um, a little bit synthesizing Peter's remarks, your remarks at the end about empowerment and individuality. I find that your surface, that whether it's the balloons or the gazing ball series, is highly participatory and very democratic in that someone who knows nothing about art and someone who spent their whole life studying art can have a very personal and very engaging experience with your art. Is that, is that the ultimate goal and how much does the surface play into that theme? Yeah. I mean, that was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was great. But I think the surface has a lot to do with it. I think that you know, it's a combination of kind of content and, uh, you know, the, the surface of it. The, you know, the, the reflection is embracing everything. I mean, the works are reflecting as much as possible in 360 degrees. And they're telling you about your environment and everything about, you know, where you are at this moment. And the, uh, you know, mind is always rewarding the body for this information. Uh, to know as much as possible about your environment. You know. As a global ambassador, when you're traveling internationally, how do your interactions with leaders of countries when you're traveling, how does that inspire you and, and really impact your future work? You know, I enjoy, uh, as an artist, being able to to interact, uh, you know, globally, internationally. And uh, it's one of the beautiful things, wonderful things about the art world is that uh, artists have always been involved in, in communication, uh, interactions uh, internationally. In the United States, I always enjoyed images of seeing uh, Leo Castelli going to Washington and uh, uh, I think giving President Kennedy uh, a Jasper Johns work and a Rauschenberg work and addition, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But in in American culture, sometimes it feels like the visual arts uh, aren't thought of as really kind of participating uh, culturally. That if you're in film, if you're in entertainment, if you're in music, that you're participating culturally, but not the visual arts. So for me, it's really meaningful to go to different countries internationally, and to, uh, uh, you know, feel uh, the participating and being able to be in contact and in dialogue with uh, people from different cultures, and to try to rejoice in a sense of oneness, and uh, that we are all one and our interests are one, and, uh, you know, the dialogue is about oneness. Very well. One last question, maybe. I think I've answered all of them. So, oh, okay, one last ring, and that's done. <laughs> when you said you had to make these machines uh, for the party hat, did you ever think about going to Detroit where the auto industry does fabricate all these different machines, and then do you get patents for these machines that you develop? Um, I don't have any uh, patents on uh, uh, the machines. Um, 
The auto industry controls very much the uh, fabrication industry. The colors that we have to work with are, come basically due to the colors that the auto industry is interested in at this moment. And uh, if all of a sudden they have the interest in, uh, in green and different shades of green, we will have much more of abundance of green paints to be working with in our daily life. And they'll be expressed within our daily life more. So the auto industry really does have a lot of control because of its size into what we have for our everyday uh, lives. Um, I have recently, I'm just uh, worked with BMW and I'm happy to say I just uh, created a, a car uh, with them, which was a really nice experience. Which is coming soon here for on a view, maybe? I, I created an art car one time, also with BMW. Like the Calder, you have the Calder here? Yeah, that would be nice, nice. But I, I made one that's a, for a small production line and uh, only 100 cars. But that was nice to, uh, uh, to work there. But these machines were uh, designed by kind of, I guess, just engineers from fabrication uh, companies and uh, just engineering of what we needed to, to make the pieces, you know. Um, I think the budgets that we have, even though I've had tremendous ability uh, to make the things I want to make and I've had the resources to do it, the resources are still more limited than what some industries have. Yeah. Well, thank you. Please join me again to thank this most amazing speaker. Yes. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to seeing you soon at the Norton and enjoy your fabulous evening. <laughs>